happy Sabbath, everyone. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. We're going to open our service with the song Majesty.
Jesus is Lord. It starts with me, the fulfilling of His call. It starts with me, to reach one for His cause. For this gospel of His kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then He will Disciple, discipling for Jesus. We are His disciples, discipling for our Lord. For our Lord. It starts with me, the fulfilling of His call. It starts with me to reach one for it. Our opening hymn this morning is Near the Cross. It's hymn number, it's kind of small, 312. And you can join us in singing and standing. We're going to sing four verses. On the fourth verse, if you, were, if you have any special prayer requests and you would like to come down to the front, that's when you can make your way forward.
as much as it is possible, let's kneel this morning for our prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, we are so grateful to be here in your presence this morning. We're grateful for the opportunity to worship you. And as we're here today, we recognize our deep need for you. And we start by thanking you that in our sinful state, that not only have you loved us, but you've loved us with an everlasting love that longs with loving kindness to draw us to you. We thank you that you've given your son Jesus to die for us, that we may have the experience of eternal life if we will accept that gift through faith. And Lord, as we're gathered here this morning, as we're, we're kneeling in humbleness before you, Lord, we lift our petitions to you. I know that there are requests that reside in the heart of, of every one of us here this morning. In some cases, Lord, we're asking for you to intervene with physical healing. There are times that discouragement comes to each of us. There are struggles that we may have spiritually in understanding and knowing what your will is and how best to follow you. Lord, you know the need of each and every heart. I lift those up to you here today, asking that in your power and in your grace that you would answer each one, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit in a powerful and mighty way on each of us here in this congregation, those that are listening, those that perhaps were not able to come today. Lord, in a special way, I ask that you be with the pastor as he brings our message to us. And we pray for Darren, who is going to be taking a stand in baptism, that you will work through him in a mighty way. Lord, we look around at what's happening here in our country and in our world, and we recognize the soon coming of your son Jesus. We long to be ready. Lord, while we're waiting, may we wait for you near the cross. May we look forward to the blessed return that someday will be in heaven and that we can rest for eternity with you and we can enjoy all that you have planned for us. Lord, give us the courage and the faith, the conviction and your power that we may hold fast to you until you come. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I hope all of you have had a wonderful week. Most of all, I hope all of you are having a wonderful day, and we're so glad that you could be with us today and worship with us. Um, those of you who are visiting, we hope that this isn't the only time that you will be here. And so if you're visiting us here for the first time today, we look forward to you coming back again, but thank you for joining us. If you're visiting for a second or third or, or more, we would welcome you to be part of our church family. And we're just thankful that you could be here with us today. Amen. A couple of quick announcements I want to make. Number one, immediately following our church service today, there will be a fellowship meal, a fellowship lunch. Whether you have brought food or not, we want to invite you to attend. We would love to have an opportunity uh, to break bread together. Something special happens when people eat meals together. It's a way for us really to draw close, and so I'm inviting each of you here, whether you're a member or a visitor, please join us for our fellowship lunch um, immediately after the service today. Also, this evening at 5 o'clock, we're going to be coming back to the church, and we're going to be having a church bonfire, small program, and then the opportunity to, again, fellowship with a meal, hot dogs. Um, if you have some hot dogs, please bring them. I'm sure if you don't bring them, there will be more than enough, but we want you to come most importantly, though, bring chairs because we want it to have the opportunity for us to just sit together again, fellowship and enjoy each other's company and draw closer to each other as we draw closer to God. Uh, one other announcement I just want to make very quickly. Uh, many of us have been waiting for this news. Brittany and Knowledge had a baby. So we're excited about that. Um, we will soon have a, I don't know if we would call the baby a visitor or a member, but at some point the baby will be here as well. The name is Shiloh Judah. So when we, if we have the opportunity, let's uh, congratulate Brittany and Knowledge on their new little baby. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Udelka if she could come forward and uh, give us a little update on what's happening at our church school. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to give you guys an update on our Grand Rapids Adventist Academy and what it 
how we started off this year. Um, we have 88 students, and um, the Lord has blessed us with such wonderful families, and these students are just wonderful too, so we're very thankful for them. We have um, a new teacher, a kindergarten teacher, because Mrs. Everett retired, and um, so her name is Nikki Grimsley, and she's very nice, and the kids all love her. She's a good addition. She came to us from Holland. Um, many things have been happening. We've had um, a high school bonding day that the kids enjoyed immensely. Um, one of our one of our um, kids here also is the SA pastor of the high school, and so he did a very nice wor a worship thought with the high school, and I thought that was very great that one of the central kids is out there being leaders. Um, next week we have a week of prayer happening. Um, the pastor from, the Bat from Battle Creek, I think, is what they told me. He's from Battle Creek and he'll be staying and working with the kids the whole week and just really emphasizing our theme this year, which is about faith. Um, let's see what else. I also wanted to um, highlight a little bit of what Central Church members do for our school, because you guys are awesome. Um, we have several ladies that come to the school and they help with hot lunch, which is a big deal because our students really enjoy it and that's always a very good thing that they do and they're so nice. So I really appreciate them. And this year I also had um, someone make 10 school kits so that if there, if, there, if there was a child that didn't have um, any um, school supplies, I could just give them those school supplies so that they can have their needs met. So that came from a central member too. So really appreciate you guys continue to pray for our school um, because God has put it here to be a light for this community. Thank you. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Today's stripper is going to be Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. And still, still. And see the salvation. And see the salvation of the Lord. Which he will accomplish. Which he will accomplish. For you today. For you today. For the Egyptians. For the Egyptians. Egyptians. Who you see? Who you see today? today. You shall see again no more. You shall see. You shall see again no more. Again no more. Forever. Forever. For the Lord will fight. The Lord will fight for you. For you. And you shall hold your peace. And you shall hold your peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ella, for reading. So this is the last time I think we're going to be talking about this for a little bit, but it is such a vast subject that the Pathfinders had a small little glimpse of Believe the Promise. For us, we should be studying this regularly because it's a journey that we all are on. Um, believe the promise. I understand that if you were pregnant, you should believe the promise. And Brittany did. And Shiloh, on Labor Day, she labored and um, was born. 
six pounds and nine ounces, and what a picture that they sent me. He looks like, yay, I've arrived. <laughs> so when, when you start seeing what God is giving us, we should believe the promise and move in His providence in believing all these things. The Pathfinders went through their own journey, and it was a long journey from Michigan all the way to Gillette, and a long journey back. Um, the journey itself is part of the experience of letting God hear your heart to believe the promise that He's with you, He will provide His presence, His power, His providence. My boys and I had the privilege um, to go to Glacier Park while we were out there already. And we decided to um, ex enjoy many of the roads and experiences. This is, um, those of you that have been there riding, what's it, um, Road to the Rising Sun. Um, beautiful, beautiful experiences. The sunsets, the, just the environment. My kids are like, we don't know if the Tetons or Glacier was better. And so, but a friend of mine said, you have to go to Manny Glacier. Now, Manny Glacier, he said, you are going to drive on this dirt road, and it's not going to be nice, but it's a short distance. And so we were driving, and it was really full of ruts and um, uh, lots of cars and dusty, and I'm like, oh, I don't really want to go on this road, but it better be good. Well, it was good. When you get there, it's like, wow, this is like fantastic. And you become excited that the journey that you had, the short little dirt road, is worth it when you get to this, these, these pictures and you say, yeah, this is going to be a fantastic experience, a fantastic day, and wonderful, and it looks like it's promising a fantastic experience. Now, we were going to leave that day, so we were in a bit of a hurry, and um, so we started out um, very easy, quick, and we could make a lot of steps happen. The miles could go by quickly when you were lower down, but as soon as you started climbing, um, I started to experience my, my age <laughs> compared to my kids, and that that, that, that uh, you started really getting into some steep climbs. And um, I, I told them, listen, I'm going to take the pictures. You guys just keep going. <laughs> but uh, it, it felt like just around the corner, just around the corner, you're going to be so much closer. And you kept going. Zachary kept the pace. He just kept going. He, we'd, Tyler and I would stop and take pictures, and I would not catch up to, to, uh, Tyler would catch up with Zachary, but he would just keep going. He says, I'll meet you and you meet me. Um, and so I just kept taking pictures and taking breaks. It was beautiful enough just to pause right there. I was tempted. Um, they said, you had this view. And then we stopped at the view and they said, um, I said to the boys, this is beautiful enough. Do we have to go further? And of course... Because we've never seen it, you're wondering what it is. And so we keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going. And uh, eventually, um, Moses said to Pharaoh, let my people go. I think my kids said to me, let us boys go, and I let them go. And they just um, went ahead, and I said, I mean, it's... It's only one road. We'll meet somewhere down the road at the glacier. Well, there was another story because the, it got rockier and um, even the goats were trying to tell us that you've got to be a little more careful in this rocky environment. Um, and Tyler just took off and was, he was the most sure-footed of all of us. Um, but every time it's just, there, there's a glacier just over there. And boy, oh boy, we were huffing and puffing, and we were going to leave that day. And I was like, well, we've got to get there, see it, and leave. But to get there was quite an excursion. And when you get to this pile of rocks, you know there's lots of people being here. So you must be close to it. And we were, 
And as you enter in, suddenly you see this, this um, surrounded, the glacier on the side and the surrounding areas, those of you that may have been there, um, an incredible experience of just, it was worth it. And you just sat there. The problem was, because I sent my boys ahead, they went one way at the glacier and I went another way thinking they're going to go to the glacier. And they were skipping rocks on the right side and I went to the glacier on the left. And I, they had the water and I had to find them. Well, I asked a number of people if they had seen them. And it's like this vast place. There's a tiny little person on the left side of the screen. You can't even see them. It's vast. And you think, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll meet up. It took another half an hour for us to actually meet. For a minute, I was like, I might have to meet them at the car. I hope they're going to start some time back. Fortunately, we didn't. I didn't do that, and we did meet at the glacier. And I sat there drinking the water while Tyler went and actually um, experienced the glacier by the, he crossed the river. I didn't cross the river because it's a long distance. That's the river I didn't cross to get to the glacier itself. But he crossed over and um, uh, he went into the glacier a little bit. And it was just, it was just a, 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 a wonderful experience of a memory that we had. It was worth it, but on the journey it felt like we're never going to get there, and we have to leave, and the pressure of, we've got to get there, finish this, um, is this going to be worth it? We've never seen this, never experienced it. When you are on a journey that you've never been on before, there's excitement, and yet when you start on that journey and you don't know how, when it's going to end, there's some apprehension. What's going to happen around the next corner? What's going to happen? We're all on a journey, and we haven't gone through this journey before, and we know that there's a journey that's it's going to have an end, and the end is going to be great and fantastic, but on the journey, we all have doubts or questions of where is this going to end, what's going to happen on that journey. And so that day we did um, over 17 miles and then we drove 25 hours, got in the car and drove 25 hours back. Because the next day, um, we had to be here on Friday evening before Sabbath to get everything ready for the next day's baptism. And we were here. But we did 5,500 miles and uh, lots of memories. My boys would do this again in a heartbeat. My wife, she's not into tenting. But we only slept in the tent and the rest of the time we were out. The whole time. But the end result, you can look back and say, yeah, let's do it again. But when you're there in the moment, and sometimes it's, it's unexpected things that happen, you're not sure. But if you're on a journey believing that the Lord will fight for you, it makes all the difference when you get to the trouble. When you get to those moments of, I haven't been here yet. But you know what? God is with me even in the moments that I haven't experienced in my life before. Last time, this is part two of the same experience. We spoke about the reason God fights for you is because He loves you so much. And the greatest way that He fights for you is destroying the principalities and powers of darkness that want to destroy you. And he did that at the cross. He's already fought for you. And the reason that I, when I met my wife and got to know her, it wasn't a year before we were married. The reason was because she fell in love with me and I fell in love with her. Love bonded and made a trust that we could spend the rest of our lives together. When God loves you and you love Him, you can bond in that love and anticipate spending the rest of your lives together. There is nothing like love that bonds, and based on love, 
you can then journey together through whatever ups and downs in life you have. And that's what God has done with Israel. And that's the experience of Moses. That's the experience of you and I believing the promise that he is taking you on a journey that he wants you to find his end. The reason to believe God's promise is because he is love. And so to believe the promise is to say, yeah, he started that promise even before the world began. That he would fight for you before he even created this world. He promised that the lamb would be slain from the foundation of the world. He promised his presence to be with you. He promised his power to be with you if his presence is with you. And if his power and his presence is with you, he will provide for you. Do you really believe that? It's a critical thing because when Egypt was being destroyed by the plagues, it was not the easiest time in that journey. But when everyone put the blood on the doorpost, they were saying, we believe the promise. When Christ comes into the home and you have his blood covering your home, you then are saying, I believe the promise that he has begun a good work and he will complete it in us. And that's what Moses did. By the way, just a recap from last time. When was Moses the weakest? At what moment of Moses' experience was he the weakest? Sorry? When he killed the Egyptian, right? And he took things into his own hand. Then he said, I'm going to help deliver because nothing seems to be working. And the impatience on the journey can actually set us back when we're impatient. And it took him another 40 years before he met God at the burning bush and God called him. When was Moses the strongest? When he felt so unworthy and he had to rely on God completely because he messed up. You know, God does not look at you and I with the messed up experiences we've had. God looks at us. Like the woman at his feet that's been accused of adultery. He looks at her, not for the adultery she's just committed, but he looks at her for who she would be and become with him in her life, with, with Jesus in her life. He looks at you for who you can become if you let him in. That's believing the promise that he wants to come in. And it's that experience where Moses understood, I cannot do this on my own. I don't feel worthy. And that's when he was the strongest, when he had to rely on God completely. And so when you believe the promise, and Darren, it's this experience you've been going through, and we're going to share that in a minute. But this experience that you've had, had to do with, I, I, I had to come to believe that God is all that he is and promises to be. It's a journey that we all go through. I want you to open your Bibles in Exodus 14. And I want you to experience this for a minute. Because this is the journey God has led the people of Israel to. He takes them to a place where it is impossible, humanly speaking, it is impossible to get out of this predicament. God leads them to a place where there's mountains on the side and there's only one way out and that's the way you came in because the Red Sea is ahead of you. Humanly, it's impossible to get out of it. 
In fact, this is what God predicted. I want you to understand that God has predicted things that are going to happen in our journey before He comes. And this experience that the Israelites went through, we will go through in many similar ways again. Have a look at verse 3, where God tells Moses to speak to the children of Israel. Go camp at this place that you cannot escape from. And then he says, because, for, Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land and the wilderness has closed them in. You know what we call that today? Fake news. <laughs> Pharaoh is going to believe fake news. Amen. Pharaoh is going to believe the misinformation. These guys don't know where they're going. These guys are trapped in the wilderness. These guys are confused. Let's go help them show them the way back to Egypt. And he takes 600 chariots to help them not be bewildered and not let the wilderness close them in and bring them back as slaves. Sounds like a good deal. That's what Pharaoh is going to do. Now I want you to understand, God predicted it. Just like he's predicted a time of trouble like you've never had before. God has predicted it. Do you believe the promise? Not the prediction, but the promise of I am with you to the very end. Well, I will guarantee, whether you like it or not, that in, as I'm standing with you today, for some strange reason that I cannot understand as a pastor. But I know the song says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. The song in the hymn book talks about this Peter experience. I will never forsake you. I will die for you. I will not deny you. And God knows us even better than we know ourselves. He just delivers them from ten plagues. He brings them to a place. And you say, and he predicts that you're going to see the, 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 the Egyptians come to you with force. And they're going to come and want to destroy you. He predicts that they're going to come again. Now have a look at the panic. This is pure panic. Look at verse 10 of Exodus 14. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Everything will be okay. We find God is going to just take us through this. Is that what they said? I'm predicting today that there will be seventh Adventists that will leave this church when they see the panic in the world Amen. and the pressures and the enemies mounting and pressing in because they have not understood how to believe the promise of what God has predicted He has provided for. Then they said to Moses, Because there was no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. They pushed the panic button. We're going to die today. They had no weapons. They had no skills against the might of the Egyptian army. And they're helpless. And they are trapped. 
by God's leading. God led them to a moment in their life that they will be trapped. And he predicted that the Egyptians are going to say, Aha! We're going to just clean this up. The very first thing God says in panic in verse 13 is when Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still. Now I want you to read this with me. This is God's command in verse 13. See the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. For the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Thank God for godly leaders that understand how God is leading us with His presence, even to predicaments that we cannot escape from. And you know why God did that? There's two reasons. The second one I'll mention at the end. But the first one is, He wanted them in Exodus 19. He says, I carried you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself on eagles' wings. You would not have escaped if eagles didn't come and take you out the, from that predicament on my wings that I sent on eagles' wings. Number one, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Fear can paralyze you when the lion roars and wants the buck to be paralyzed because in the split seconds that the buck is paralyzed, it gives the lion the advantage to catch him. And the devil, like a roaring lion, wants you to be terrified for even split seconds in your life because it gives him an advantage when you are fearful. And the first thing God says is, do not be afraid. Stand still. The, the instinct of the lion roaring is to run. And God says, no, stand still. You cannot outrun a lion. This roaring lion that wants to devour you, you cannot outrun it. Stand still. And then he says, and see, see these things that are going to come, that are going to work because I am with you. See that these things are going to happen to you. See beyond your fears in the eyes of faith. See beyond your fear when you believe the promise of all God is and has promised, even prophetically. By the eyes of, of, um, of faith, we look beyond the time of trouble because He's promised to deliver us. Beyond the fear. And then He sees you have to train your soul to look before the reality comes. Don't wait for reality and crisis and then say, Oh God, what are you trying to tell me in this? No, you've got to, before that, have a relationship with God so that when you get to that moment, and He may even be leading you to that moment, you can see before the realities of the predicaments and the troubles and the, and the, the problems of life. Before the reality comes of pressure and problems, you see through the eyes of faith how God is and has been and will be with you. Amen. So you see beyond the fear and before the reality because you're experiencing a living presence of God. And you believe God 
in the eyes of faith. And in those eyes of faith, you believe Him because He's proven Himself in the past. He has shown Himself to be a present reality. Like Elisha said to his servant who came to him and said, Master, they surrounded us. Hey, what can we do? And Elisha looks and says, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see God's reality. And as his eyes are open, he sees chariots of fire of angels all around the city. And he says, wow, there are more that are with us than are with them. When God is with you, he's always the majority. <laughs> and God says, stand still. I need your attention. I need you to stand still and listen. The enemies, the Egyptians you see now, you will never see again. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to hold your peace because the Lord will fight for you. You will be quiet when you experience God fighting for you. Darren, come right on up. Tell us about how God made you stand still and how God is fighting for you. And tell us some of your experience that you've had today that brings you to this moment where you are planning to commit your life completely to Him again in baptism. Absolutely. So I had several standstill moments throughout my my life, but my story begins with actually first grade. So I was in the first grade, and I think it was even first day of school, I go to school and there's this girl in third grade, and I, I, I took notice of her right away. I'm like, wow, that is, she is really pretty. And so then I, you know, I go back home. I think I even bragged to my mom or, you know, I was excited about her and said, boy, there's this pretty girl in school. When I grow up, I really want to marry her, you know. And you're in first grade, so you're, you have, it's like you look at Jesus as Santa Claus, you know, I can say a prayer and he's going to just give me whatever I ask for in my prayers. And so, the, you know, and then, of course, that's just first grade, you know, you forget about that. And the only, the only reason why I remember it is because I, I remember praying to God, you know, if I, if, if I grow up and you let me marry her, then I'll serve you forever, you know. So I'm trying not to get too emotional in this, so I might, I might panic and lock up, but hopefully not. So, so anyways, let's get off from that. I, that, that was my, that's, that's my first memory in my whole life's testimony. And so what happened is we, we go through school, you know, she's, she's two grades ahead of me and we're just going our separate ways, but she would let me call her on the phone once in a while, you know, and so I was, I was thinking there was a chance, you know. And so anyways, she, we get to eighth grade, she gets to eighth grade first and she goes her way and her mom sends her to public school and then I graduate eighth grade and, and I go on to academy. And so we, we go our separate ways. Through, throughout my years, uh, I spent four years at Cedar Lake Academy. And while I was there, I was young and I was kind of not really, you know, I, I never had a personal, even though I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist, I never had this personal prayer and devoted life with Jesus. I was just in a family and it was a practice. For me, my whole experience was, I'm going to go to church, you know, and, and eventually by the time I was a teen, my friends weren't Christian, mo most of them, and so I was into this thing where I'm just going to do what my parents say, I'm going to obey, I'm going to go to school, and then I'm going to go my own way. And so I, you know, was going to do everything my, myself, you know, and so I, I go to, I graduate from elementary school and I go to high school, I waited that out, and I get to the end of high school and go on and to, to college. I actually did really well, 
and I got a scholarship to either go to Andrews University or go to Southern College. And I decided, well, I'll go to Southern College. And so I went down there, I had started having a lot of fun, but I realized, you know, it only took one semester that there is no way that I'm gonna get good grades. I'm having way too much fun. I, I, I need a break. I've been just, you know, doing all, do, obeying rules and following everything, and I just wanna go on an adventure. So I decided the best way to go on an adventure is to join the Marines. <laughs> and so, so I did that, I went, I come back from basic training, and, and then, you know, I was, I didn't have my own place, I, but I decided I'm, you know, I'm gonna come back, and I'm just, I'm not gonna go back to Southern, I'm gonna just live in Muskegon, and so I landed in my parents' house, and the rule is, okay, if you're gonna live with us, you have to go to church, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and so I'm like, okay, so I go to church, and I run into this girl that I met in first grade, again. And so we, needless to say, we started dating for pretty, pretty quickly, you know, we decided, oh, we, we want to get married. And so we were planning to get married, and all of a sudden the Marines comes back and says, oh, uh, this was my first standing still moment. The Marines says, that's nice that you're planning your life and you're going to get married and you're just signed up for college, but Saddam Hussein is said otherwise and you need to go to war and we hadn't even got married but we were planning to get married so all at that at the time that we were going through this everybody thought Saddam had weapon biological weapons we were gonna we were gonna go over there and get gassed and we were all probably gonna perish and so that was the first real standing still moment you know <clears throat> so we, I, I, it was prayer and it was in and out, you know, because I wasn't, when this happened, I wasn't living a Christian life, but the fact that I could die was this standing still moment, you know, you better, you better have a conversation with the Lord. And so I get through that, I get back from the Marines and get get back we i come back we get married and we start living our lives we get really busy i'm going to school doing the marines on one weekend a month and working in a factory because i always wanted money so we i basically worked about 20 hours a day and slept four days four hours a day for you know eight years or so it wasn't that bad but it felt like it and so anyways you make yourself busy you 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 take life as if you're in control and you can do everything. And through those times though, there, you know, you, you run into issues. Uh, one of our first things that happened was we, we get pregnant, we start to have kids, and both of our children were born a month early, and they, you know, they had to be under a light, and there's that feeling that hits you with, I, I'm not in control of this situation, you know, and I want my children to be healthy. And we went through that, you know, a big scare with Brandy. And then two years later, my son is born, have an even bigger scare that has you going back and reevaluate. And he had to be in the neonatal clinic for two weeks. And through that time, we were really worried, you know, he might not make it and just, a lot of that and and all of these things made me stand still and and want to do have the desire to do the right thing and of course we had with children you ha you have this your your you really want your children to grow up in a safe world and you want them to have morals and and you know because you're raised a christian you want to raise up your kids that way and so we started off that way, and we, we were bringing our kids to church. And eventually, though, we got busy. I started doing things like uh, being gone for three or four weeks for work and working on the Sabbath and things like that. And eventually, without really even knowing when and how, you're, you're not going to church anymore. And you're, you're, your life is all focused on your children, and you, are, you just get busy. 
and you, there you you be, our, our, my family we our lives evolved around our children, and so all of our focus was around them, around all of the activities that they did, but we had left the church, and so there was that missing component, and that didn't really show itself as being a huge issue until we were looking at a time in our lives where, and in our marriage, where now the kids are gonna be going away. They're gonna be going off and doing their own thing. And during that particular time period, uh, all of a sudden I realized that my marriage is gonna to come to an end in this situation. And so uh, I, we ended up getting through the divorce, but we, we didn't wanna, we wanted to wait until our youngest was you know graduated from high school and so then we pulled the trigger on that and got got through all that but i found myself both of my kids moved out and my wife moved out and so i was all of a sudden having this big standstill moment of you got to reevaluate and figure out what to do but uh i couldn't handle being alone for not even a little bit so I decided, well, you know, and at this time, remember, I wasn't living a Christian lifestyle. And so I said, you know, I really, because I don't like living alone, I'm just going to start dating. It doesn't matter to me. You know, in my mind, it didn't matter to me their, where, what their background is, where they come from, how, how religious they are. And so you, I get into this relationship. Everything is wonderful about the relationship, except... The fact that there would be these rifts, you know, uh, during, during, through that, I realized, you know, I don't really like this aspect and this aspect. And, you know, to make a long story short, you, you find yourself struggling. And I started to get myself into this turmoil of, I like this girl, but I know I can't marry her. If I marry her, it, it's sealing my fate. I am never, there's no chance of salvation. And so there was this struggle. Whew. All right, so there was this struggle with that. And I tried to fight it and couldn't, couldn't get anywhere along that journey. And this, this is a process that lasted about five years. But for, for the last three years of that, I would start to figure out, you know, I discovered Strong Tower Radio and I would start to discover these places of peace and serenity that I could create for myself where, you know, I would work, I would work on a deck or something like that. <clears throat> and, and then I could, you know, I'd have Strong Tower on. There would be wonderful sermons by Kenneth Cox and it would create this peace. And then... <clears throat> You know, I, it would it'd, it'd get to the evening, and I and I would come inside, and as soon as I walk in the house, it was like I was walking out of one side of life and and walking through a door back into darkness, and things like you know TV that you don't want to watch, and <clears throat> well, I gotta gotta pause for a second. So, anyways, I would I would have these this constant turmoil of, you know, I, I want this lifestyle, but I'm stuck in this lifestyle. And Strong Tower helped me a lot. I, I liked, I talked about it with my mom. She actually had me uh, get in, she actually set up a situation where she told me that Cam Ferguson from Strong Tower was, was coming to the, to the church in Muskegon. So I visited Muskegon Church that time, and I had started vis visiting other churches through Strong Tower's influence, and I found out later in hindsight, all of my family were, of course, praying hard and making sure that I was having this internal turmoil with God and try, you know, where God was working. He was working his angle. So I have this conversation with Cam, and he was just, you know, it wasn't necessarily about, you know, religious things. It was just the way that he thinks lined up perfectly. He was, he logically thought about life and everything. And it was just so in tune with how, with how I think. And it was, 
it was that conversation that said, okay, I'm going to commit to trying to, trying to live, live right. And then I try to do things like see, you know, try to encourage the person that I was with to come to church with me and things. <clears throat> and needless to say, you, you, a person that, you know, not, we can't, we can't do things to make people, oh, thanks. We can't do things that, to, to force people to do what they don't want to do. And so that's how that went down. I, I got to this point right here at that phase that I finally reached this, the biggest standstill situation. I would try my hardest to, to do things and, and think through things. You know, maybe if I just do this or if I say that, I can win her over, I can, we, you know, I can make this work. But it wasn't prayer that I did, you know, it was like I was doing this on my own and I was kind of having prayer, mostly more like meditation with God, not really praying to him and directly asking. So finally, I get to a point where I just directly have this crying on your knees <clears throat> conversation with God and say, look, this is something I cannot do. I'm just going to I'm just going to give up. So, so either you're going to help me with this battle or I'm just going to give it up. And, and so anyway, I get up from that prayer and um, all of a sudden there was this instant peace. You know, it was like, it was like, you don't have to do that. You don't, you don't have to work anymore. You're just done. And so, man, it's the hardest thing to get through. So anyways, I, I did that, and the Lord took that over. Because of that peace, I no longer tried to, you know, it wasn't my job anymore to struggle to try to say the right thing or, or set up the right circumstances. I just said, you know, just whatever. I, I, I got this sincere feeling that I didn't have to worry about it. And so it wasn't long after that, like, you know, days maybe, at the most a couple of weeks that I was coming up on a birthday. And so my partner said, hey, you know, how about if we go, and, and we were struggling a little bit, and we knew that we were both struggling, but I didn't know that she was having some of the same thoughts that I had about maybe we've got to break this relationship up. And so, because in my mind, she wanted me to marry her, and I was kind of stuck on, she wants me to marry her, I've got to change her, instead of, well, maybe she doesn't want to marry anymore, you know, but I didn't think of those things. And so she, 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 said, she proposes this vacation that we go on, and then she, uh, you know, I was like, yeah, that sounds great. And then she ended it with, yeah, and when we're on vacation, we'll, we'll, we'll have a serious talk. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, and then boom. By the time we came back from that vacation, we were both contented and relieved that we were going to mutually separate ourselves and break up and but it wasn't it wasn't anything hostile where I had to get out of this relationship and feel terrible about it and and feel guilty that I really hurt someone it was just the way the way God did it was beautiful and through that through that and around that time just before that actually happened also there was another standing still moment of my, my daughter had twins and they were born 11 weeks early. And when that happened, this was before the breakup, when that happened, that really had me wanting, I was, wanted to pray and I wanted to have as many really strong people of faith, of faith praying because I was desperate to make sure that her twins would not have any problems. And so, boy, oops, 
that that was a that was a blessing. That experience, they they had no no complications at all, and they're just beautiful girls. And that during that during that trial of of asking for God's help in prayer, that really cemented my 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 relationship. And from that time on, I wouldn't miss church for anything. And and then I started doing, you know, getting a, a bigger relationship with God and reading Steps to Christ and things like that. And that's where I'm at today. That was my, my life journey. And so, yeah. <laughs> Did it. <laughs> We're just grateful God is not finished with us yet. No. And He is on the journey with us and wanting us to acknowledge His presence and this, these standstill moments that He allows in our lives. Thank you for sharing, Darren. Yeah. And before you go, we're going to get ready for baptism in a few minutes. As Darren has committed his whole life, he understands um, the, the, the theology, understands some of these things, but practicing it is a living experience with Jesus. And that living experience is what's happened and you again. Need that. It's not just go to church, do what I know what to do. It was, I, I didn't do that. All growing up, I never had, as a young person, I, I never did that, and that's that was that was you know I could have avoided a lot of heartache. That's how we all learn. And when <laughs> when God becomes real in our lives, He really is allowed to fight for us, and that's the journey. So, on your professional belief, and we went through the the studies again, affirming that this relationship and baptism has to do with letting the Holy Spirit have re-control over your life. And so Darren and I are going to share the profession um, of what we believe and the church, we're going to ask you to respond on the side and just say we believe that too. So Darren and I, we believe the death and resurrection of Jesus has provided everything that is needed so we can have eternal life. We believe the Bible gives guidance to the important issues in life. We believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ and look forward to eternity with Him in heaven. We believe God gives special spiritual gifts to His people to be used to bless our community. We believe baptism is a sign that we want to be committed followers of Jesus Christ. We believe in participating in the body of Christ and belonging to God's worldwide remnant church. Based on his profession today and having gone through the preparation and the studies, is there a motion today to accept him on condition of baptism? There are many hands and seconds. Everyone in favor say amen. amen. And so Darren and I are going to prepare uh, for baptism as we're going to invite the children to come up for their story at this time. And as the children come up, um, our practice in this congregation is that they will be collecting offerings that you want to give to the worthy students. And thank you, Yudelka, for reminding us of um, the education that started already.
Good morning, boys and girls. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. Are you guys enjoying your Sabbath? Yes. Okay. So our, my story today is based on patience. How many of you guys have had to wait for your mommy and daddy to give you something, whether it be candy or maybe a pet? Yes. So I'm going to tell you the story of a boy. His name is Atsel. He's sitting right over there. Can you say hi, Atsel? <laughs> um, he had asked mom and dad for a pet, a very special pet. Um, for me, it's kind of a scary pet. And it has eight legs. It has very funny looking eyes. It has two fangs. It comes in different sizes. Sometimes they're hairy and asking. Until I told them, you know what? You go ahead and do research on everything this tarantula will need. So look up their habitat, look up what they eat, how many times they eat, what they need in order to survive. And he said, okay. So he started doing his research. And I started doing my research. And I found out that they eat brooches. They eat mealworms. They can eat flies. They can, once they get like the size of your hand, they can pretty much eat a mouse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like, ew. I was not very pleased about that. And you're supposed to feed it every four to seven days. So they probably eat once a week. They do need water. So I, he started doing his research. He came up to me and told me, this is what we need. This is, and I was like, okay, well, you know what? We'll give it two years. He was nine. He was nine years old when he started asking. I seriously thought I was like, he'll forget in two years. No big deal. And no, he did not forget. By his 10th birthday, he goes, Mom, I have one more year. You promised that I would get a tarantula when I'm 11. And I was like, OK. And six months went by. And he goes, Mom, this habitat for it, this is what it needs. This is all the stuff that it will need to eat. I was like, okay, I think you're ready. So by his 11th birthday, he was patient, and he got, he got his little baby tarantula. It, was, it is so tiny. I said, can you bring it? So there is a story in the Bible about Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, they were promised by God a baby. And they waited. 
and they waited and they waited until finally Sarah was pregnant. So they were patient, just like God said was patient. They also were patient with God's promise. Sometimes our parents might not tell us, okay, yes, I'll give it to you right now. But if we are patient, they might give it, give it to us later on. Okay? And just like God, sometimes we might ask God for something. And, but we do know that we have to be patient for him to give that to us as well. Anybody wants to pray? You do? Jesus, thank you for the Sabbath. That was the way to patient. Listen to our parents. Jesus. Amen. You can all go back to your seats. There are many times that God is patient with us and is waiting for us to make this decision, right, Darren? Right. So I, uh, I am privileged to be part of this experience that you have made the Lord real in your life. I'm going to invite any of your family that are here that would like to come up and uh, just stand on the side and be closer to this because they've been praying for you. If you want to come up and surround them, um, on the sides, I'm inviting the family to come right up here. These are the ones that have been praying for you. And um, I, I like the prayer of making us restless until we surrender. <laughs> so any family who would like to do that. And while they're doing that, um, Jim has something that you've been through a series with him as well. And maybe I'll let you... Um, hear this just for a minute. Dear, and I know God has brought you on a journey, and it started a long time ago. And there were different parts of that journey, and I know one small part was that you had an opportunity to attend some meetings here in March, and what a privilege it was for me for you to be there, but even more so that God was able to work through that and touch your heart. And as you told the story this morning about how uh, you had a journey with God going back a ways, and in that journey, you had stepped and walked away, but have come back. It reminded me of, of what God has said in the Bible here, talking to Jeremiah, where God's people also had been with God, but then they had walked away. And at the end of that, in Jeremiah, it said, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt. That God has a plan to rebuild you, but not just you, but every one of us. And God's plan isn't just to rebuild you to what you were before, but the plan is to have all of us rebuilt and restored into his image, what he had intended before there was ever any sin. And that's a journey that we're all on, and we are so excited that you're taking the step today to be one with God again. Amen. I'm going to ask the family just to come stand this side and this side so that the, the congregation can see as well. And there we go. So this is the moment because of your commitment to God that you want to love Him with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. It is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And there is great rejoicing in heaven because there's one more sinner that God can complete his work in. Thank you. As Darren gets changed, is there anyone here this morning that's seen and heard and experienced his witness that would like to stand and say, I want to join him and be baptized very soon as well in preparing for Jesus' soon coming? Amen. Stay standing. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. God bless you. Thank you. You can go have a seat. Thank you. Anyone else? I know there are some that are preparing for baptism very soon. And Faith, you're next. October 1, right? The first Sabbath of, of October. October 5, first Sabbath. And I don't want to close this without saying how important baptism is. It is giving your life to Jesus to die to self and let Him be alive. And there may be someone else that has chosen to do this. And I know that there are some people that have chosen to be rebaptized because they have experienced a newness in God's presence. If there's anyone else that wants to commit to being baptized in the near future, now's the time to indicate it or talk to an elder or talk to me. But if there's someone else, please stand and I want to have a special prayer for you at this time. I'm going to pray for you guys. Father in heaven, you are drawing us with your loving kindness. You want us to surrender our lives to you. You want us to experience the joy of salvation in Jesus Christ. And you want us to have the peace that goes beyond understanding. Bless these that have stood today. And you have begun a work in calling them. And they know it. And they want to respond to it. And so continue to bless them and guide them as we prepare for your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. It's definitely a high Sabbath, isn't it? One of the uh, very important waymarks on the way to the kingdom is baptism. And uh, that was wonderful. An incredible experience that Darren uh, had and will never forget and that we were all a part of. And I personally want to thank you for that, uh, Darren, and letting us be a part of it. Um, how many people have thought throughout their lives about heaven and what that might be like? The majority of you. I know in our family as we were growing up, uh, we had a garden and sometimes we would talk about how big the pepper plants might be in heaven and we might have to climb up to the top of them to pick the peppers. Um, how big the watermelons would get. How far we could see, how tall the trees would be. Um, giant insects with beautiful wings that we could call and they would come to us. Uh, even with all of those things that we can imagine, uh, the Bible says that we're a little bit off base. It says that I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those that love him. This song is about that. It's about, well, the title of the song is, That's Just What Heaven Means to Me. And of course, the main thing about heaven for each of us will be Jesus and our being able to be with him. That's just what heaven means to me.
Thank you, Jeff, for that beautiful message, that beautiful song. At this time, we have an opportunity to participate in the service as well uh, through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And I'll just make a, a brief comment. We've been studying the book of Mark in our Sabbath school class this quarter, and today's lesson, part of it focused on the widow and her giving of her two mites and how Jesus stopped and made a comment about that, that all of us here have heard that story. And we talked about two things in our class this morning. Number one, that she gave out of her poverty. And a lot of times, uh, as givers, we think that we're only supposed to give out of our abundance or our surplus. And it's a reminder to us as we're contemplating when we're giving to God, are we giving because we have excess or are we willing to give until it hurts? 
But number two, perhaps even more importantly, is that the, there's a reality that the widow nor us, we don't really give to God. We simply return to him. That everything that we have has come from God. And are we willing to return to him that which he's given to us? Our offering today is going to be for a local church budget. I'm going to invite the deacons, if you would come forward, we'll have an offer or a blessing on the offerings and the tithes. And just again to remind us as we're contemplating what God has done for us, are we willing to give to him in a sacrificial manner? Let's bow our heads. Dear God, we want to acknowledge, first of all, that everything that we have has come from you, not just our finances, but every breath that we take, every relationship that we have, every thought that goes through our minds. The origin of all that is because you have created us and we belong to you. I ask as we give here this morning that the offerings and the tithes will be going to their intended purpose, that your soon coming uh, would be hastened, and that one day very, very soon we can be with you in heaven. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. What an experience is ours when Jesus enters the heart. Darren, thank you for sharing that with us. I want to add that it's not just standing still that God wants. He wants you to go forward. Amen. The only reason He wants you to stand still is because He wants to get your attention. Now that He has your attention in making you stand still to realize that without Him you can do nothing... In the eyes of salvation, going forward is the critical factor. And he talks about this in Exodus 14, where he says to Moses in verse 15, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Now the question was, where were they going to go when they're going to go forward? They're by the sea. Where's forward? 
Egyptians and your enemies want to take you back. And you have friends that want to take you back. God wants to move you forward. And the only place forward is to go towards the sea. So before God even provided a way in the sea, He tells them to go forward. And the only place they can go is towards the shoreline. Put your feet in the shoreline. And they move forward, believing the promise that God is fighting for them as He moves between them and the enemies. And Moses lifts his staff and the wind begins to blow. And the sea parts and dry land for the animals and for the kids and for everyone with their carts and their camels and all the rest. They move through on dry land because God is saying, I want you to go forward, not back. And the eyes of faith will always move you forward to see how God is working now is trying to get your attention to wanting to move you forward. And God never moves back. It's called the upward call that Paul talks about. And so, there was a world that was so evil that God wanted to move it forward, He had to destroy it to move it forward. Called the flood, the worldwide flood. Even though they didn't understand and see and know that a worldwide flood is possible, God prepared Noah and the ark and the animals for it. And when they moved into it, they were moving into the forward thrust that God had. We have to move forward. One of the most devastating experiences that the disciples of Jesus has ever had was when he was crucified. And they thought that this was the end of all their mission. This was the end of everything. When God was going to move them forward, the crucifixion for the disciples was the most devastating experience until the resurrection. And when they saw him again, God was going to move them forward. The, the enemies thought this was the end of this movement when God just began a movement called the Christian church. God is in the business of moving forward. And this Christian church experienced a place called 1844, a great disappointment. In this country, there was a notable experience. Most people don't want to know about it, and those that are not Adventists have no clue about it because they're not interested. But that experience is what moved the church to actually move forward. Prophetic experience. A great disappointment. And this church comes out of that disappointment because it moved forward. Because God is in the business of moving forward. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is the greatest and the largest Protestant educational system in the world. Amen. Health. The most rapid movement in the world. Because they're moving forward with how God is leading. And I know that some people are going to experience disappointment in this church and be just like the great disappointment, feel like they're going to move and want to move out of the church. Be careful that God might bring you to a place that it's impossible for you to get out. So don't leave or get out because He's moving forward. The signs of the times... Disasters, wars, famines, all kinds of things. You know what God's sign of the time is? He wants a people ready for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on them. Are you ready for that sign of the Holy Spirit being poured out so that you can move forward with God? Look for the signs of the time of the Holy Spirit being poured out amongst God's people. 
Because he's going to move forward. I ask you a serious question. And I don't, I don't worry about your position on COVID or masking or whatever else. But in COVID, worldwide COVID, were you feeling like you're moving forward with God? Did you feel, hey, this is something urgent and serious and we better take note and move forward with God? If you were too busy arguing with the politics or arguing in your church about masking and not masking and being in or not being in and you made that your focus, you may have missed the opportunity of moving forward with God. There was an opportunity to say, consecrate your life to God. When these big things happen in the world, move forward with God, not back. Stop your petty conversations and see what God is busy with. Move forward. As soon as COVID came out, the prediction of the nations are angry happened just like that. Wars and rumors of wars and the nations are at each other's throats. The nations are angry. It's just building that anger, setting a stage for moving you backwards when God is wanting to move you forwards. Don't get involved with the anger of the nations. Move forward with what God is doing. And the greatest is, you're going to be hated, persecuted. You're going to be chased down. Do you know why you get chased down? Do you know why you get persecuted? Because you're moving forward. Amen. You're not going back into the world. You're going out of the world. You're different than the world. You're moving forward with God and the world will hate you because you're moving forward with God. And you know what you're preparing for? The second coming of Jesus Christ. And the world talks about all kinds of other things. You're talking about Jesus coming. Because you're moving forward. There is never a time God took Israel back to Egypt. There's never a time He's moving backwards from the cross. He's moving forward. And he knows what lies ahead. And he knows there's trouble. And he knows there's a time of trouble like you've never had before. But God is going to move forward into that time of trouble. Do you have the energy to want to move forward into that time? And say, yes, let's do this. Because God is going to fight for me. Yes. Yes. See, moving forward is not the option of a Christian church. God is never going to take you back. He's going to move you forward. We have to be ready to move forward with God. So standing still is just getting ready to move in God's pace forward. Your persecution of your enemies is because you're moving forward. They will chase you because you're moving forward out of this world. And they don't understand. And the very thing that they accused you of, of being bewildered, they themselves start to experience bewildered experiences in the stars and the signs of the sky and all the other catastrophes and things. They start to become bewildered. And in bewilderment comes panic. And your enemies start to experience their chariots that are trying to chase you get stuck in the mud and their wheels fall off inexplicably. And there is a clear indication from the enemies before they are destroyed. The Lord will fight for them. And the Lord's fighting for them. Let's get out of here and it's too late. You have to prepare yourself to be ready to fight. The fight of faith. And let God fight for you. And the enemies that you experience in this world, you will never see again. Because you're moving forward to where God is calling you. What rejoicing. What joy. 
What untouchable joy. And you know, Moses sang a song. We are going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. When this is over, we're going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. I want you to hear what they declare why God fought for them. God says to Israel, the Lord saved Israel, and it says in verse 31 of Exodus 14, Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. God worked this miracle of opening the sea so that people would be affirmed in their belief of the promise of His presence, of His power, and of His providence. Oh, if we experience this. God, number one, did this for them. God is going to fight for you so that you can see He's on your side and He's real. But when they got to the promised land, and the Philistines and the Hittites and the Jebusites and all the Tites and the Ites and all the rest of the uh, the nations that they were going to invade the country... There was fear in the country because they heard what God did to Egypt. There was fear because they saw how God provided. How does this group of more than a million of people survive in a wilderness without food and and, and the rest? God provided. They became fearful because God was fighting for them. I want you to understand that God is going to fight for you. And He's going to bring you to places where you cannot escape. You, that Andrea and Tammy will sing the response. I'm going to start with Stand Still and the congregation. You sing Stand Still. Just respond like they do. And so... This experience of God fighting for you has to become a real experience, just like God's real for you, Darren. And you have to believe it before you get into trouble. And so today, before you leave this church, if you want God to fight for you, participate in pressing together. Make sure you've given Him your life in the song and said, yes, I want you to hold my hand Take my life and fight for me. I'm going to give you my all because you've become my all. And at the end of the song, I'm going to invite all the elders to meet me with Darren right here in front. So that even during the song, you're welcome to come up and we're going to have a closing prayer as we place our hands on Darren and ask the Lord to fill him and fight for him as Darren connects with him. Stand still, stand still, stand still, for the Lord, for the Lord will fight, will fight for you. Don't fear, don't fear, stand still. For the Lord Lord will fight fight for you. Your enemies you'll see no more. The promised land you will explore. God's glory leads you on before. The promised land you Your enemies you'll see no more. Move on through the sea, for the Lord will fight for the sea for the Lord 
will fight, will fight for you. Your enemies you'll see no more. The promised land you will explore. God's special treasure you will be. His holy nation. Don't fear, stand still, for the Lord will fight for you. Don't fear, stand still, for the Lord will fight for you. wings God bore you on eagle's wings God brought you to dwell with you and guide you on eagle's wings God bore you wings God brought you protecting you provide for you on eagle's wings God bore you Move on through the sea, for the Lord will fight for you. Move on through the sea, for the Lord will fight for you. Believe the promise. The promise, believe, believe the Dear God, we know that all heaven is rejoicing today. We've seen and heard the testimony that Darren has brought, how you have moved in a mighty way, that with loving kindness, you have drawn him back to you. And we are so thankful for that, that we could witness that. Lord, as we move forward uh, here as a church, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen uh, Darren in his journey that continues. But in addition to that, Lord, that each and every one of us, each day, would recommit our lives to you, that we would be strengthened each and every day as we come to you and continue to move forward under your guidance. We pray this in Jesus' name. I join this prayer and say thank you that you're not finished with us yet, that your purpose is in your presence and your promise and your power and your providence. As a church with Darren, we want to recommit our lives to you and say, take our lives and hold them in those nail-pierced hands of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and guide us, lead us. 
So may the promises of God the Father, the sweet presence of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit abide with us and empower us in preparing for Christ's soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.